introduce myself. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Rima. I'm a third year medicine resident. I'm going to geriatrics, and this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, so with that, let's jump in. Um, okay, right off the bat, my advanced key isn't working. Awesome. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, so some objectives. I hope at the end of this, um, you are able to talk to your elderly patients about clinically significant depression and how to manage that in the outpatient setting. And then we're going to pivot in the second half of this talk and talk about age-related changes in sexual function and how to address these concerns with your geriatric patient. Okay. So um, my mom is texting me. Um, first, we're going to meet Louise. Um, she's an 84-year-old woman brought to your clinic for evaluation of dementia by her son. He's very concerned in the past year that she's neglected personal hygiene. She naps a lot during the day and uh, subsequently has a difficult time sleeping at night and doesn't really want to leave the house anymore. She takes no meds, um, no focal neuro deficits, vitals are normal. You do a quick mini cog in clinic. Um, she can't recall two of the three words and doesn't really give a college try drawing the clock because she says she's tired. So our first question is, what would you like to do next? And if we could launch a poll now, that would be awesome. Do I get to see the poll? Never done a poll before. Yeah, we'll uh, close it once something like two thirds of people answer. Okay, wonderful. So um, by and far, most people have selected the correct answer, which is the geriatric depression scale. Um, a smattering of people have selected a comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation, which we will talk about. And then a few people have suggested a brain MRI and then um, I was hoping at least one person would select a hearing test. Um, if I can, um, oh, it doesn't select the right answer for me. Okay, sure. Um, so a brain MRI um, is often done on these patients and you can see characteristic changes in certain types of dementia, um, in both vascular dementia and Alzheimer's, there are characteristic changes. Um, it's not a routine test because we have so many clinical ways of making these diagnoses, but if certainly you're worried about like a space occupying lesion or um, a mass uh, of some other kind or a bleed, then certainly brain imaging uh, could be valuable. D, thankfully nobody answered because that's not a thing that we do. Um, a sleep study um, in the right context has a lot of benefit and quality of life and daytime fatigue for sure, but I don't hear, at least in my like very tiny vignette, a lot of things pointing in that direction. And then a hearing test, um, you know, a lot of times people don't realize that their hearing is going, but they have a difficulty in their social settings. And this, especially nowadays, is really incredible hearing uh, devices like hearing aids have become a lot cheaper nowadays than they used to be. So certainly if you have clinical suspicion for decreased hearing, then to, to do that. But my point for now is um, don't forget about your medical evaluation. I know that you wouldn't. Um, and then in someone who you're worried about decreased mood, um, certainly their cognitive function might decrease and that would be a lot more gradual process than something like hypoactive delirium. But in a clinic setting, it's really hard to figure out the timing of these things. So if you're not really sure, just make sure you're not missing any sort of infection and then to look at their meds. In this case, Luis doesn't take any. So an over uh, overall point is that depression can present as a cognitive impairment or worsening of a pre-existing cognitive impairment uh, in geriatric patients. And this is really common. Um, I want to make the point that depression is not part of the normal aging process, but the risk of depression rises drastically as we age. Um, do, do, do. um, there's no distinction in the DSM-5 based on age, um, and the USPSTF criteria to screen patients for depression is still annual in these patients. Um, and the risk of depression in the elderly population can go further up uh, with risk factors like recent onset of physical illness, severity of their illness, or if they have multiple illnesses, functional disability, limited mobility, and of course, poorly treated pain. There's also an association that female patients have a higher risk of depression than male patients for reasons I don't think we know yet. 
Um, and then obviously management and coping with things like this is further compounded by loss of independence, social isolation, and change in functional status. You, um, you may cover this question, but there is a question about um, if you can comment on the wait time for neuropsychiatric testing outside of the VA. Uh, I guess at the VA, it's like six months. Do you know um, how long the, t the wait time is? Oh, uh, it is a long time. I couldn't comment on how long. I've had one patient successfully get through it done, and that took about six or seven months. But I will comment on what that looks like. Yeah, at, at Harborview, the wait time is probably about that too. And there's a lot of insurance issues for whether it's covered or not. I A hole in my knowledge is about what things are covered and not because I've been lucky to work at the VA for the last couple of years. And that's a very good question. Um, in terms of screening, uh, I think we're all familiar with the PHQ-9 um, and the geriatric depression scale are pretty equivalent in detecting depression in older adults. The PHQ-9 requires a little bit more mental dexterity to kind of quantify how much, uh, how, how often you're experiencing these symptoms. So uh, in a patient like Louise, who is having, um, you know, so much fatigue and um, decreased concentration, something like the geriatric depression scale might be easier. And that's why, do, why am I having a hard time advancing? There we go. Oh, now it advanced too far. Okay. Um, and that's because it's a yes, no question. Um, and the positive answers aren't necessarily always yes or no. Um, and I, and I really think this gets to the core of, you know, how, how depression, I'm sorry, I'm distracted by my cat, <laughs> how, uh, depression manifests in older adults. So you can see some of these questions are, do you prefer to stay at home rather than going out and trying new things? How is your, how are you coping with your memory? Um, how is your energy? Do you feel hopeless? Um, there, the original geriatric depression scale was like 30 questions or possibly more questions and was quite kind of time consuming. At some point in the eighties, this 15 item score was verified and validated. So this should take about five, 10 minutes in clinic. Um, and if you have a underlined answer or a positive score, then that gives you one point. Any score greater than five suggests clinically apparent depression, um, and a score above 10 is pretty damning. Okay, if a patient has pre-existing dementia um, in a mini mental exam of less than 15 at baseline, um, the geriatric depression scale may be difficult also. So there is a new score ish about a called the Cornell scale for depression in dementia. And this takes the focus a little bit off the patient um, in terms of who's answering questions and puts it on the clinician and quote unquote an informant like a caregiver or somebody who works in their nursing home. Um, it's quite big. Um, and the questions cover five domains, mood related signs, physical signs, behavioral disturbance, changes in daily uh, or nightly mood and behaviors and ideational disturbance. Um, I'm going to open this link to show you and hopefully you can continue to see it. Here is the score and I hope to dem demonstrates the kinds of questions that are asked. So because changes in mood uh, and functioning can look very different patient to patient, it's quite comprehensive and how that might um, manifest. So whether it looks like anxiety, sadness, irritability, et cetera, it goes on for pages and pages. And the questions are based on what can be witnessed by people around them. Has the resident seen fidgety or restless in the past week or unable to sit still? Um, what kinds of physical symptoms may they be developing now that they didn't have before? Um, interests in the hobbies that they have? And this goes on and on. Okay. So this is a little bit more helpful if the patient is unable to participate much on their own. Okay. Oh, good. For a second, I thought the meme wouldn't load. Okay. So I just made the point that um, cognitive impairment uh, could be due to underlying depressive mood, but I also, I just want to make this a little bit more complicated real quick. Um, it also kind of goes the other way around. So this is complicated and um, I hope that you know, we develop really good relationship with our patients as they age so that we can kind of tease this out. I want, one study showed that 16% of patients dwelling in the community and 44% of patients in a hospital or SNF setting um, with Alzheimer's disease also suffer from depression. So 
there are some studies that imply that depression could be an early manifestation of Alzheimer's disease. And then conversely, if you have cognitive impairment from depression, this might predict later development of Alzheimer's disease. This is an ongoing uh, discussion slash study, um, just, to, just to make it more complicated. Okay, so I am so happy that people raised questions about this comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation. I do want to talk about what it is real quick. So it's quite uh, lengthy and time consuming and very costly. And as folks have brought up, it can take a long time to get patients seen by the right person. This is not something that'll be done in our primary care clinics. These are done by dedicated clinical psychologists. Um, often SLP can help us with things like this, depending on your setting. Um, the first one on the top left, I chose a couple uh, examples. I think we're familiar with, we use this in the hospital quite often, the number tracing, uh, and this looks specifically at attention and working memory. Next, we have something called the groove pegboard test. And this, um, let's see if the video works. All right, so this is, so this is a pegboard test. Yeah. Er, this is a pegboard and these are the pegs. And the examiner points to the pegboard and then shows the pegs. Uh, all the pegs are the same. They have a groove and a round side and a square side, and so do the holes on the boards. What you must do is match the groove of the peg with the groove of the board and put these pegs into the holes like this. need to watch her do all five rows. She does it quite quickly because um, this again looks at psychomotor functioning. Um, um, later in the video, you can watch someone do it slower. Obviously you're looking at how well people are able to manipulate the little pegs and put them into the grooves that rotate through the board. Um, on the bottom left, we have a visual spatial assessment called, um, oh my gosh, what's this called? A uh, block design test in which all these blocks are scrambled and then you are observed making this pattern or whatever pattern they hand you. And then my personal favorite is called the Stroop test, which looks at cognitive function, um, executive cognitive function. Um, the point of this test is to read or uh, out loud say the color and not read the word. And I've been doing this for the past like months that I've been putting this presentation together and I'm not getting any better at it. I'm wondering if a brave volunteer may try it out on the spot for us. We can give it a shot. Thanks, Caleb. Uh, let's go, it's the color, not the, not the word. Correct. All right. Uh, red, blue, orange, purple, green, blue, purple, green, red, blue, orange, purple, red, blue, purple, red, orange, green. A little slow <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Caleb. That gets, that gets very nerve wracking. It does. And I admittedly put you on the spot in front of like 50 people. So thank you. Hand for Caleb. Um, I slow way the heck down halfway through. And then the one blue that is correctly says blue and blue for some reason throws me off. Um, it's a cruel test, but um, I think slowing down at some point to uh, it is fairly normal, but slowing down and getting stuck uh, and of course getting it wrong would be um, something to worry about. Rima, is that a time test and is it based on the time that someone gets on that? Um, I've seen it different ways. I think if people can get through it fairly accurately, even if they slow down, some people are more reassured by that. I have seen uh, there's different lengths of it. So presumably the different times also correlate with how long it is. Um, the most, the papers I was reading was talking mostly about accuracy and less about time. And then I noticed that a lot of these require visual uh I mean, the groove test looks pretty small and also the manual dexterity. And I, I wonder what your thoughts are about this, given that so many of our pa uh, older patients um, have limitations in those areas. Yeah, I think uh, that's exactly the next point I was going to make. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I'm on computer. Um, 
There are different tests within each bucket, um, but a lot of them, as you mentioned, rely on things that we may not have, uh, you know, the eyesight that we had 50 years ago um, or the grip strength that you had many years ago. Um, so this belongs a, is a very small portion of neuropsychological evaluation. Obviously we have to put this in context of their medical history, their psychiatric history, any neurologic things going on, any medications. Um, there's a lot of interview with patients, families, and their uh, caregivers for collateral. Um, and then all of this is, you know, ongoing and plastic to adapt as patients continue to age. Um, I fell down a wormhole and kind of looked into each one of these tests. And you're absolutely right that most of them require quite a lot of dependence on eyesight. Um, some of their instructions are really complicated too. So, um, you know, whether it's hearing or reading instructions, I think a lot of these were initially developed for the pediatric and TBI population. And I hope that we continue to develop tests that rely less on visual acuity. Okay, let's go back to Louise. Um, you administered the geriatric depression scale and she scored an 11, which uh, is greater than 10 and strongly suggests um, clinically apparent depression. Now, what would you like to do? Do, do you want to do you want to pull? Yeah. Uh, Javel, are you able to help us with the poll? Yep. Yeah, okay. Awesome. Thanks, Gina. Takes that long at the UW, so. Oh gosh, no. Why is my keyboard sticking? I'm sorry, everybody. That's okay. The majority of the results were in before you showed the answer. Okay. Okay. But for those late people who waited till the answer showed, shame on you. <sighs> I haven't, the irony here is that I have a brand new laptop and I was like, I'm afraid of like not knowing like <laughs> how the new laptop was going to work. So we're using the old one and it's sticking. Okay. So we have Proxene, brand name Paxil, Sertraline, Zoloft, Quetiapine or Seroquel, St. John's Worth, and then avoiding medications altogether and starting CBT um, and enrolling in a physical activity program. Um, I will say that CBT and physical activity is never wrong, um, but I do not think that uh, avoiding medications altogether is warranted in a patient who is clearly uh, suffering. Um, my poll results went away. Um, I will briefly comment on St. John's Wort. There is like scattered evidence that it does help with mood. Um, but as we have talked about in lots of presentations before, like Gina's, I remember, um, there's not a lot of FDA regulation on what goes into nonsense that you pick up over the counter. Um, and I generally tell patients to stay away from non-regulated things uh, and homeopathic things, even if it being quote unquote natural is, um, reassuring to some people. So then we're left with quetiapine and two SSRIs. Um, we use quetiapine a lot in the hospital for a slew of reasons, but it is not as effective as an antidepressant as SSRIs, which are first line. And then it comes down to Paxil and Zoloft. So let's dig in a little bit more about why I think sertraline is the right choice for Luis. Um, so here is a lovely table. Um, I'm just going to move John's face over so I can see my titles. Um, <laughs> so in the first camp, we have SSRIs. Um, and for both SSRIs and SNRIs, we want to make sure we're monitoring sodium because of this risk of SADH. And from what I can read, that risk is a little bit more common in older patients. Something I've learned in the past year is that it does lower bone mineral density. So if patients have a history of falls or fractures, um, or indeed osteoporosis on DEXA scans, then I may be more hesitant to start them. Um, 
both citalopram and escitalopram have a risk of QT prolongation. I don't know how much that affects Louise since she's not on any other medications, but certainly if patients are on other like cardiac meds, I may stay away from those. Fluoxetine is generally a no-no in the elderly population because of how long it lingers. Um, that does mean that you stay away from withdrawal side effects, um, but fluoxetine is one of the more sedating SSRIs and that makes me nervous. Um, I almost never see Paxil prescribed in this population and that is because it uh, is quite anticholinergic um, and you know, day-to-day -day people can be feeling withdrawal symptoms because its half-life is so short. And common withdrawal symptoms for SSRIs are things like dizziness, which obviously you want to stay away from in the geriatric population. Sertraline is incredibly well tolerated. Some people have mild uh, abdominal discomfort, like mild diarrhea. Um, and certainly you can ask patients about that. Um, and titrate down or switch if you need to. Um, SNRIs are generally more activating, um, but do come with anticholinergic side effects. Um, uh, for a lot of women who may be still experiencing the tail end of vasomotor symptoms from menopause, uh, this is probably a good class to choose from. The mean age, as you know, of menopause is 51, and, but the mean duration of vasomotor symptoms is like seven years. So there are a few unlucky women who are suffering the indignities of menopause and hot flashes well into their 60s. So um, keep that in your back pocket. Um, I then the other medications, you know, Wellbutrin is fairly safe. It's safe in heart failure. It has less of a risk of hyponatremia than the others. Um, and mirtazapine is pretty helpful in older patients who may be having like the dwindles of geriatric syndrome and decreasing appetite if you're worried about weight loss. But do know that it might be sedating initially. This side effect usually goes away after the first few weeks once you've reached steady state. Gina, I came across that too, and I decided to just uh, skim right past it because I don't know. Um, I sent an email to one of our VA pharmacists to ask why it seems to be more sedating in elderly patients, because I too thought it was one of the ones that um, we like in younger patients. I don't know the answer to that. I'm still waiting on an email. Okay, any questions about the different medications for depression? Okay. Here's our slight pivot. Um, before I move to the second half of my talk. How am I doing on time? Good, okay. Um, any questions about managing depression in the elderly? This is the racy meme that Max sent me when he heard about what my topic is. I laughed for like 12 straight minutes. Um, I'm just gonna leave it up for appreciation and then move forward <laughs> for a second. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, um, sexual functioning changes drastically with age. Uh, I think it'll surprise nobody here that um, reports of sexual activity decreases as people reach geriatric ages. There's lots and lots of reasons for that. Um, I am going to make the pathophysiology, or I shouldn't say the path, the physiology of sex very unsexy in the next few minutes. Um, I also want to call myself out and say that I've made a lot of gender assumptions for the sake of brevity on my slides, but I hope breaking it down to physiology um, means that we can extrapolate and apply it to our patients who identify uh, in lots of different ways. Um, we can see at my chart at the bottom that all four stages of sexual activity uh, are impacted as we age. Um, so when we talk to patients about changes that they're seeing, um, we can talk about where they're possibly having the most frustration. There's a wonderful resource on the AARP website. I, um, the URL is at the bottom, but you can also Google AARP Sex and Intimacy and this pops right up. This is a screenshot I took yesterday. Um, you know, I'm so happy that Will went first because he talked about how even in younger patients, this is something that is embarrassing uh, and, and patients don't want to talk about both mood and sex. You know, a lot of the folks that are currently in the geriatric population um, were raised in a much different 
social context than we have been, where this is not something that they want to bring up to a stranger or uh, to anyone, maybe possibly even their own partner. Um, so I love that yesterday this paper was, uh, this article was published last week. There is an article about how to talk to your doctor about this. So I took a screenshot of that also. Um, and the very first sentence calls us right out. Uh, most physicians are ill-prepared to talk about sexual health and many patients are too embarrassed or ashamed to broach the subject. Um, this Dr. Evelyn Dacker in Oregon uh, says that we need to start having this conversation with our patients um, and I 100% agree. So we're going to spend some time learning how to do that. Okay, so we're gonna meet Molly. Molly's a 64 year old cisgender woman presenting to primary care, reporting pain with sex, particularly in the last three to four months. Um, she's a fairly healthy 64 year old, hypertension, diet control, type two diabetes. Her last period was about 12 years ago. She's on a loaded pain, multivitamin and vitamin D. She lives with her husband and her two dogs. She had one pregnancy many, many years ago. She retired two years ago and otherwise is chilling. I'm hoping people can either in the chat or verbally share what kinds of questions you might like to ask Molly next. I have hope that somebody brave will volunteer or put it in the chat. Yay. Wonderful. Um, the usual um, symptoms, when do they start? What is it exactly that she's feeling? Any bleeding? Wonderful. <laughs> um, wonderful. Excellent. I'm really happy that Rebecca brought up risk of STIs. There's a whole Scrubs episode about how doctors are biased and forget that things that affect young people also affect older people. Sayule, I love it. Is it specific with sex or is she also having difficult uh, symptoms throughout the day? And then Astrid, wonderful. This is such a stress point in relationships. Um, you know, if Molly is avoiding sex altogether because of how uncomfortable it is, surely this is going to put a strain on their sexual relationship. Okay, let me see if I can answer some of your questions on the next slide. All right. So she's sexually active only with her husband. I didn't put how often they're having sex, but we can say, let's say once a week. Um, it's particularly vaginal sex has been very uncomfortable, particularly during the insertion portion. Um, and she's feeling quite guilty because it's not improving despite their attempts, uh, including increasing time spent in foreplay. No bleeding, no discharge, no urinary symptoms. You do a genital exam and you find that her mucosa is quite dry and pale. You don't see any rugae, um, but her cervix looks normal. Um, the vaginal pH is normal. There's normal, you don't see anything alarming on wet mount and there's no hyphae on KOH prep. Um, so now what would you like to do? Can we launch another poll, please? This is what I was hoping would happen. Okay, wonderful. So um, not a huge role for oral estrogen therapy in these patients, wonderful. Um, I threw sertraline in there just as a throwback to our first half of the topic. Um, there is a selective estrogen receptor modulator called that I struggled to pronounce, <laughs> that is C, um, that we will talk about. And then there's a topical moisturizer or a lubricant and a topical estrogen therapy. I agree that um, the reason I expected this is because I feel like in practice, this is what I see people present with, um, you know, changes associated with after menopause and, and decreased estrogen, and we prescribe vaginal estrogen therapy. But actually the Menopause Society has recommended that um, we start with a topical vaginal moisturizer first. 
So I'll get back to that. Let's quickly talk about what it is that we're diagnosing. And the new umbrella term in the last 10 years or so is called genitourinary syndrome of menopause or GSM. And it's mostly driven by a loss of estrogen causing urogenital atrophy. This presents in loads of uncomfortable ways, um, but by and far the most common symptom is dryness. Uh, and this affects women throughout the day, not just during sex, but obviously is most, um, it prohibits a lot of sexual functioning, but this affects quality of life, uh, romantic relationships and self-esteem. You can imagine going, trying to go about your day, but you are distracted by dryness and um, burning, itching sensation in the in your nether regions. You can see on the, the on the diagram how drastically um, blood supply and elasticity of your tissue as estrogen decreases. So this is the way that I think about it in my head. Um, decreased estrogen causes decreased collagen elasticity and blood flow. This then um, reduces vaginal discharge leading, uh, resulting in dryness. The tissue itself becomes much less thick. Um, even the muscles involved in your pelvic floor control and strength are impacted. This often, um, especially for women who've had vaginal births, um, can cause prolapse of pelvic structures. Um, and it sets you up for things like recurrent urinary tract infections or dysuria because of decreased bladder capacity and sensation. So when you are meeting people uh, who are complaining of symptoms like this, um, I feel like we don't do thorough pelvic exams as much as I wish we did. Um, I don't remember, at least at my medical school, really talking about how to do a pelvic exam aside from like how to do a pap smear and how to do like a bimanual exam. Um, so obviously you want to visually inspect the external structures and look for signs of atrophy. Um, and then because you're, you know, making your differential in your head and making sure that you're looking at things like trauma, discoloration, erythema, uh, signs of infection, rashes. Um, and then you can use a Q-tip to kind of go around the external surfaces with a Q-tip, um, making note of where patients are tender, um, much like a clock face. And I will say, uh, we'll talk about a study in a moment, but by and large, most of these patients have um, pain and discomfort right at the vestibule, meaning the like uh, innermost, but still on the external surface uh, entry to the vaginal opening. Um, and often at the most like six o'clock position posteriorly, right where I hope you can see my mouse um, because of how the, the tissue atrophies in that region. Um, and there's quite a lot of nerve bundles in the area. Interestingly, um, despite the dryness, folks don't tend to have tenderness uh, in, within the vaginal mucosa itself. So again, just, you know, things that affect older people are common in older people, but things that affect all ages also affect older women. So make sure that you're keeping other symptoms on your differential because they may present similarly or indeed at the same time. So having, you know, evidence of atrophy doesn't preclude you from having other things like vulvar dermatitis or lichen sclerosis. Um, I have this poor lady in clinic right now. Uh, I don't know if Sudna's on the call. We were talking about how, uh, how bad we feel for her. Her dryness symptoms are so awful that she's been taking like boiling hot water showers, um, and using a lot of over-the-counter nonsense for symptom relief, but has now developed superimposed vulvar dermatitis on top. And it just, I feel so bad for her. So um, lots of things can present this way and or indeed at the same time. So management, first line for dryness, discomfort and pain with sex, as I mentioned, is a vaginal moisturizer. Um, trying to avoid things like scalding hot showers, uh, wearing cotton underwear and other things to uh, feel some relief. And then second, line, or like, let's, if you're not controlled then, then we can add topical estrogens if you don't have any contraindications. In practice, I generally tell people to do both. Um, and then uh, there's a study that came out a few years ago that said creams, tablets, and a vaginal estrogen ring are all equivalent. So it truly comes down to patient preference, whichever they feel that they can physically manage uh, or would be more comfortable with. Um, and then severe symptoms can be treated with systemic selective estrogen receptor um, modulators. I don't personally have any experience prescribing this yet. 
Any questions about management of GSM? I'm gonna peek in the chat. The estrogen inserts can be messy. Most of my patients seem to like the tablets, which you can insert with like a little um, tubey thing. Um, and then vaginal moisturizers, no. Um, a lot of, there's a, oh, I'm totally blanking on the company. There's an over-the-counter company that's quite affordable. Um, yes, yes. Thank you, Jessica. Wonderful. Agree that the urogynecologists at the VA are really lovely. Um, and in fact, they taught me this. I was talking about how often I see this in clinic at the VA Women's Clinic, and um, they told me about this study. It's admittedly a really small study. They looked at 55 women in 2022, um, mean age of about 60, um, who have been experiencing painful sex for a long time, um, somewhere in the ballpark of six years. Um, and then their pain score out of 10 was, you know, seven. But so that this really goes to show how uh, inhibiting this, this process is. Nearly all of these patients had physical exam findings uh, of vulvovaginal vaginal atrophy. And then again, in this study, um, most women experience symptoms right at this posterior vestibule. Um, in addition to doing, you know, topical um, lubricants and topical estrogen, um, specifically at that posterior part where there's a nerve bundle that may be more exposed or fibrotic um, with surrounding structures becoming atrophied. Um, if you target that nerve bundle, that specific area with topical lidocaine, um, I have a couple patients who are so relieved with this. And the study said that 91% of uh, these women with topical lidocaine had their pain come down to zero. Um, so again, it's not fixing the problem exactly, but while you're doing the other things, this can be helpful. Um, at the uh, sexual health clinic at Harborview, uh, one of the APPs shared a story of um, a woman coming in to talk about this. Um, and the APP shared that, you know, as we lose elasticity with aging, in fact, having more frequent sex, uh, as long as your pain is being addressed, actually helps with the elasticity. And apparently, and I really wish I'd been in the room for this, uh, her husband piped up at this point and said, see, I see you weren't being enough of a hoe. I love that story. Um, but there is truth to that, that if you, um, you know, address the pain and folks are having more frequent sex and that might be helping with the vaginal uh, elasticity. Um, if there is concurrent pelvic floor dysfunction, or if it's you're just not making any headway and it's too uncomfortable, then um, pelvic floor PT is incredible. And I will not go into that more in more detail because we had a fabulous academic half day on that some time ago. Oh gosh, why is that happening? Okay, we'll just skip the poll part. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, let's meet Vincent now. He's a 68-year-old uh, man presenting to clinic with an eight-month history of gradually worsening erectile dysfunction. He doesn't have any morning or spontaneous erections that he has noticed. Um, you talked about your depression screening tools, and he screened negative. He's quite active. He doesn't smoke any cigarettes, and he also takes no medications. These fictional patients with no medications. Um, he, on physical exam, is you find nothing particularly interesting. You do a basic lab workup. Uh, his fasting glucose, his LDL, and his TSH are all within normal limits. You do an AM testosterone, and that's also within normal limits. Um, my animation on this slide, for some reason, isn't working, so I'll just tell you that a PD-5 inhibitor is first line, and I think most of us have experience in prescribing this. My personal soapbox is that we spend a lot of time talking about male sexual dysfunction and not nearly enough time talking about female sexual dysfunction. Um, so of all the questions from my not to work, I'm okay that this one didn't work because I think you all knew the answer anyway. Um, B, C, and D are not things that I feel comfortable doing in clinic in any case. Um, and if I'm really striking out with the PD-5 inhibitor, then that's when I start talking to uh, subspecialists. Okay. Erectile dysfunction is super common. I'm willing to bet that most people in this chat have um, addressed this in clinic. Um, by age 70, 70% 70 of men have experienced uh, frustration with this. 
Um, and the nice thing about PD-5 inhibitors is that like, regardless of the underlying cause, 60 to 70% of people experience um, improvement in symptoms. Things that I didn't know um, is that uh, sildenafil tell, tell, oh my gosh, PD-5 inhibitors work better with uh, on an empty stomach. As you probably remember from Sketchy, please don't use them if patients are taking nitrates at the same time because of the risk of hypotension. And similarly, um, be a little bit more careful if they're on an alpha blocker for the same reason. Um, patients can experience some adverse effects, um, like lightheadedness and dizziness. People can develop headaches, flushing, um, and then you would like to walk back the dose if they're experiencing those things. Um, I just want to say that at the VA, we are limited on how many we can give people, and a lot of patients are really frustrated by this, and I wish there were there was a solution to that. I think it's like six tabs for three months. Okay. So we mentioned testosterone in the last chat. I don't know if it's like a social media thing or what, but I've had a, re like a really steep uptick in patients coming to me in the last few months really convinced that they have low T. Um, and often people mention this with erectile dysfunction concerns. Um, because I just proved to you that both are, uh, erectile dysfunction concerns are really, really common. Um, but actually, hypogonadism is more closely related to decreased sexual drive than erectile dysfunction specifically. There was a really cool study a few years ago called the European Male Aging Study. Um, and a subset of that big study was the sexual function questionnaire. Um, and their goal was to figure out whether we can clinically identify patients who are likely to have low testosterone versus those who have other sex changes that I mentioned that there's a, a ton of. Um, they recruited 1,600 people, um, and they looked at overall sexual functioning, masturbation, sexually functioning related to emotional distress, and overall changes in um, sexual functioning. I do not understand why those are two different things, overall sexual functioning and change in sexual functioning. I fell down a wormhole last night, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into that, but they had four domains. Um, and they, they did it. They had a huge, huge uh, questionnaire uh, and several uh, clinic visits, and they were able to clinically predict who had low testosterone levels versus people who had higher T levels. Um, we can borrow part of this. These three questions are ver are validated to restratify patients who have uh, who may have hypogonadism. Um, so number one, I think, is the most interesting. How often do you think about sex? And if folks are saying two to three times per month or less, then that uh, suggests decreased sexual drive. I think the standard answer is usually like once a week, according to the paper I read. Um, so if folks are saying that they're still thinking about it, but there's plumbing or piping issues, then it's probably less likely to be hypogonadism. And then because it's all related um, and there's a psychological component to, uh, and, a, and obviously a testosterone component to keeping an erection uh, and how often do you awake with full erection? And these three questions are, are part of this questionnaire. Um, if they have all three questions sorry, all three answers that are, you know, consistent with what I have on the right side of the screen. And these are the patients who are like a little bit more likely to find hypogonadism. I think this is somewhat more pertinent in areas where it's not as easy as we have it at UW to just check a 10 a.m. fasting glucose. And in fact, I just kind of routinely do this with patients who I am um, worried about either uh, age-related changes, um, indeed low T or erectile dysfunction. Um, I had one patient right now who's young, uh, and he had his total testosterone checked at like a third party lab. And he came in with papers that showed that his T was low and like, how could you not believe me, Rima? Um, but his labs were drawn at like two o'clock in the morning, or I'm sorry, two o'clock in the afternoon and not in the morning. So, um, we verified, we did them properly at 9am at the VA and they came back within normal limits. Um, so make sure that you are indeed drawing them at 10 a.m. I think of the VA that you can't draw them, not before 10 a.m. I don't think they'll like, the labs will, will actually collect it. Um, and then there are some physical exam findings that, um, are suggestive of hypogonadism, like, uh, hair loss, uh, on the body, decreased, uh, testosterone, uh, scrotal volume and other things that might clue you into this diagnosis. Rima, I just wanted to let you know that we're running short on time and I don't know if you wanted to um 
if there were some wrap up things you wanted to try to head towards. All right, almost done. Uh, last year I finished really quickly and this year I overcompensated. Um, if you're finding low testosterone, make sure that you're actually diagnosing primary hypogonadism and not some pituitary issue. Um, let me see. Yeah, okay. Um, there was a study called the testosterone trials that showed that folks who truly have low testosterone, you do see benefit in normalizing the testosterone either with uh, intramuscular or transdermal patches. Um, uh, some patients at the VA who feel, they feel really like cognitively foggy, but um, normalizing testosterone, unfortunately, has not been shown to increase cognition, but does, in fact, uh, improve libido sexual function um, at the cost of often increasing hemoglobin. Um, there is some risk that it increases. There, there's evidence to show that it increases plaque burden, um, and it also increases bone mineral density, but specifically at the spine and not necessarily in regions that we would like it to, like at the hip. Um, I have some points to make about things that you should monitor, but I think you know those things. Like, look, uh, don't be a little bit more cautious in folks with uh, BPH or uh, increased hematocrit um, and monitor those things if you're starting testosterone. And then for the sake of time, I will not open this up to the group. Uh, there's lots and lots of medications that affect sexual functioning. Um, I think this is a med list that we may often come across, somebody who may have some uh, depression and cardiovascular concerns. Um, and I will say that a risk benefit discussion is warranted, but often um, these are not meds that I want to take away from somebody who has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and letting patients know your rationale for that. And then, as I mentioned, even mixed type of erectile dysfunction uh, can be treated with PD-5 inhibitors. Um, increasing libido in patients who have lots and lots of reasons for it to be decreased um, is, is tough and frustrating for patients. Thank you for your patience, everybody, uh, and my technical difficulties and my interrupting cats. I um, am going into geriatrics, and I'm not at all an expert in this now, but I hope to be one day and would love to chat with you if this is something that we have in common. Please, please reach out. Awesome. So awesome. Thank you so much for that.